Good evening and a warm welcome to Site Dublin County Council's webinar on our most ambitious strategy for cycling. Um, we'll just wait for a short time to for other people to attend. We only have a couple here at the moment, so if you'd like to just wait for a few minutes, please. Thank you. Good evening once again and another warm welcome to South Dublin County Council's webinar on our most ambitious strategy for cycling. First up, I'd just like to deal with some housekeeping issues. Um, could I ask all of the presenters to remain on mute, please, until your turn to speak? Also, I would like to um, welcome the participants to type your questions into the Q&A, which is located on the right hand side of your screen. It's just the little box with the question mark in it. And a reminder to you all not to post any personal information into the Q&A. And a thank you to those of you who have already emailed in some questions, which is very helpful. The strategy we are here to promote is called South Cycle South Dublin, a programme of work. Why you might ask would the council devise such a strategy? And there are many reasons. Cycling has become more and more popular, and I've been told that there isn't a bike to be had uh, this side of Christmas due to such a big demand. A couple of reasons why we have developed this plan. One of the first ones is, is that in 2018, it was reported that Dublin was the third worst city in the world for sitting in traffic. I have to repeat that statistic as it's quite shocking. Dublin was the third worst city in the world for sitting in traffic. What a title to hold for our lovely city. Why? Are we Dubliners wasting our time sitting in traffic? The hours reported amounted to 246. Therefore, Dubliners spent 246 hours sitting in their vehicles in 2018. It's quite an incredible statistic. South Dublin County Council take their own annual traffic counts and from these counts we estimated that prior to the pandemic the traffic growth in our county was 11% and growing. So our roads are choking. There are also some positive motives as to why we devised this wonderful strategy. Cycling is a healthy alternative to the car, thus reducing the number of unnecessary car journeys, which contributes towards a reduction in carbon emissions, which is a win-win. Cycling investment produces tangible and measurable benefits to local economies. Ta cycling investment produces tangible and measur measurable benefits to individuals, assisting people of all ages to get more exercise and lead healthier lives. This evening we have five speakers. First is Mick Mulhern. Mick, if you would be kind enough please to get your presentation ready, but do not share just yet. Then we have Vanola O'Driscoll of the National Transport Authority. 
After Finola, we have Ronan Carroll, South Dublin's project manager on the Dodder Greenway. And following Ronan will be Ali Minari, South Dublin's road safety officer. And finally, we have Kevin Baker from the Dublin Cycling Campaign. So Mick is our first presenter this evening. And Mick is the director here in South Dublin County Council. His directorate is Land Use Planning and Transportation. Mick is a town planner and urban designer by profession, and he only joined South Dublin County Council last year, but is already part of the furniture. Prior to joining South Dublin, Mick spent 16 years working in London, delivering multi-million mixed use regeneration schemes for the mayor's office. Mick is passionate about the built environment and the benefits that great places can bring for people. Mick believes that Cycle South Dublin, a programme for work, is the first step to realising his vision and ambition for how South Dublin can become one of Ireland's most cycle friendly counties. So Mick, you're very welcome. And if you would like to please proceed with your uh, presentation, please. OK, Jennifer, are you able to hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I'm just right. trying to send your content out, sorry now. And there we go. OK, thanks, Jennifer, for the for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> so as you said, today we're talking about Cycle South Dublin, our, our proposed programme of work. And, and as you say, my name is Mick Mulhern. I'm the Director of Planning and Transport uh, in, in South Dublin. Um, so we'll just take, I'll speak about five minutes or so, just talking through the content of the strategy and, and really what it is that we're trying to achieve. Uh, through that, I mean, it's important to remind people as well that this is a is a public consultation um, which runs from the 17th of November till the 18th of December. So we're actually really keen to get people's input into into the strategy and, and what we're talking about doing. So, as a council, um, we we've got a proposed vision for South Dublin to become one of Ireland's most cycle friendly counties. Um, and a mission to provide people with a well-connected, well-designed and safe cycle network that offers people a credible alternative to using their own car. Um, ultimately, look, we recognise absolutely that, that as a council, we've got a long way to go to get to that point, uh, but we will use a variety of measures uh, to do that. So what will ultimately guide our work are our objectives, um, which set out our proposal to provide a comprehensive and connected cycle network to make cycling a more achievable mode of transport for all people, young and old adults um, and kids. And ultimately, alongside that, to improve the cycling identity of the county. Sorry about that, it seems to be skipping. Um, there's a couple of key elements that we'll have to do as part of that. Namely, what we've done, the first step is, which is part of this, is about arranging our programme so that we're clear and our councillors are clear and the public are clear about what we're trying to do. So we've broken that down into existing now, soon and later works. The second big thing is about securing government funding. The third is, as we design projects, we do that to the highest standard, complying with DMORs and the NTA cycle standard and delivering cycle net, segregated cycle networks. Where possible, we think it's really important to build political and community engagement and support for what we're trying to do. We need to do better on, on how we do our maintenance works. And also, this is going to be a live programme where we review and respond to changes and realities on the ground. Uh, so whilst it's a 10 year programme, we fully recognise think things will need to consistently change. So I think Jennifer's covered a lot of this already but, but why are we doing this um, and I'm sure a lot of people on the webinar will, will know already but 20% of carbon release in Ireland um, uh, is from transport on which 52% so nearly 10% of the carbon released in Ireland is as a result of private cars. As Jennifer's already said we've had an 11% increase in traffic congestion since 2016 and actually over the next 10 years our population in South Dublin is going to grow by 50,000 more people so traffic is only going to get worse. Now the NTA are doing a huge amount of work on Dark Plus and Bus Connects and, and Lewis uh, uh, capacity improvements but ultimately they are long difficult and hard infrastructure projects to deliver and actually cycling can play a key role in delivering stuff on the ground now. Um, the national cycle policy framework is a target of 10% 
uh, of people cycling frequently each week in, in London, that's 20 percent. And in the Netherlands, they've already achieved 50 percent. And I think it's really interesting to note that actually people say, oh, the weather is, is terrible in Ireland. You'll never get it. Well, actually, it rains more frequently uh, in the Netherlands than it does here. Um, uh, so in, in South Dublin at the moment, one of the most challenging things we have is the fact that 3.8 percent of our adults cycle frequently a week. And when you compare that to the 10 percent as a national target and the 50 percent that the Dutch have, you know, we are way off that figure. But in a really positive light, 21 percent of South Dublin's population have said that they would like to cycle frequently, but that they have various reasons why they don't want to do that, including a lack of a network, lack of confidence um, and, and so on. Um, and it's also just important to note that as it stands today, we've got 207 uh, kilometres of cycle network in the county, uh, but, but, but we absolutely need more. So what are we proposing to do? Um, well, as I said, we've broken it down into, into four categories. We have that existing network. Um, we have, we, we've got a package of projects identified for the next four years, which we call now. We have our soon projects, which are four to eight, and our later projects, which are eight to ten. So in total, they come to 41 projects, totaling 170 kilometres at a cost of about 240 million or so. And on top of that, then we've got six uh, routes by, to be delivered by the NTA, which will be about 40 kilometres uh, delivered by 2027. Uh, so in total, that's uh, 47 projects totaling 210 kilometres. Uh, that's what we want to achieve. And, and just interestingly, down the side there, we're, we're just noting that as part of this, ultimately, there'll always be trialing stuff, temporary measures to, to test ideas as we go through. So on the on the first piece, this is just a map showing our existing cycle network. It's it's 207 kilometres. Some of it's in very good condition. Some of it's quite new. Others, uh, not so much, you know, uh, white lines on a road, dashed white lines on a road, a metre wide. So, you know, in some circumstances, they're, they're way below par of what we need to do. So actually, one of the things that we start, one of the things that we're doing right now is actually starting an audit uh, of all of that to identify like where can we do you know light segregation where can we do uh, quick maintenance etc so that's a piece of work that we're kicking off on, on now and will lead to various kind of maintenance light segregation uh, interventions um the second which is what we're focusing on now is our is our now scheme and within that there's 19 projects that totals 95 kilometers of cycle lane at a cost of about 130 million or so um and that's what we that's what we want to kind of move into delivering over the you know have delivered over the next four years so just to show within that network that we've just spoken about uh in 2021 we'll be working on nine projects you can see them on the map the first one is the selbridge link road uh the second is a, a, Lu a, a canal grand canal to luke and green urban greenway uh we've got monastery road in Clondalkin. we've got work Sorry, this is on a timer for some reason. I can't turn it off. Uh, we've got the N81 Jobstown Junction um, in uh, in Killinarden. Uh, we've got two schemes in Tallatown Centre, Belgard Link Street, Tallatown Centre scheme. We've got Wellington Lane, we've got the Dodder Valley, and we've got Grange Road. So they total about 28 kilometres of cycle lane that in 2021 will be on the ground on seven of those with two hopefully through through planning, through detailed design and may well be on site. But that's 28 kilometres. And just to put that in comparison, you know, that's what we're trying to achieve next year. And if you put that in comparison to what we've done over the last couple of years, we've delivered um, over the last four years, we've delivered eight projects, projects uh, totaling about 25 kilometres. So our ambition as a council is drastically uh, enhancing. Then in our now category, we've got 12 projects uh, identified here, which total 40 kilometres at a cost of about 60 or so million. And in our later scheme, we've got 10 projects totaling 35 kilometres at a cost of about 50. Um, then in our last one, which brings it all all together, we've got this is just a completed network uh, which includes bus connect. So in total, that's 41 projects, 240 kilometres to be delivered over the next 10 years. And that's ultimately the fully connected network that we want to focus on. We would hope to deliver us sooner than the 10 years, but that will ultimately come down to, to funding and staffing resources, securing planning permission for these things, and you know, and an ambition to do more than that within the 10. So, you know, where does that leave us? The, the final agreed programme will guide all of our cycle working priorities of the council. Individual designs will then be progressed for each of those uh, 19 schemes. Part A planning applications would be progressed. 
in the now phase, we've got eight of those projects are already underway. Uh, seven of them have planning. And as I said, eight, or it was actually nine, sorry, uh, nine of those will hopefully be in the ground tomorrow. Uh, a significant amount of funding is needed to deliver all of these works. As I said, eight have funding in place already, and we're in discussions with the NTA and the Department of Transport at the moment about you know, a funding envelope for at least for the now schemes for those 19 projects. And depending on how much funding we may, is made available, we may be able to do even more uh, than, than, what we've, than what we've set out there. So the next steps for us as a council are, we presented our schemes to council. Uh, there was an agreement to start a non-statutory public consultation. We've got our online webinar tonight. The, the non-statutory consultation will close on the 18th of December, and we hope to bring a, a full agreed program with a funding commitment from the NTA back to our council for approval in Q1 2021. And then each year we would bring a monitoring report to council uh, every year on how we're doing. Uh, so that's it from me. Um, uh, I'll pass back to, to Jennifer at, at that point. Thanks, Mick. Um, that was a very clear and comprehensive review of uh, Cycle Site Dublin and its plan. So I have one question for you here. Um, it's a question on connectivity and cycle track locations. And this question is from John, John Bird of the Knock Lion Network. He asks, um, how did you decide where the cycle tracks should go and why? Um, it's a good, uh, it's a good question. I mean, I mean, ultimately, the, the start for this is, um, you know, there's not enough cycle network in in South Dublin, as I as, as I've shown on that plan already. It, it's woefully un, under provided for. So, um, but so the question is, is where do we start? How do we how do we change from what we have at the moment into something much more comprehensive and much more connected? Well, our starting point was three things. Firstly, we've got nine villages in, in South Dublin, uh, Sagart, Newcastle, Rathcool, Lucan, Parmestown, Tallaght, Clondalk and Rathfarnham, Temple Oak. And then we've got the two big retail centres of, of Liffey Valley and, and Talla. Uh, and so ultimately our network connects those nine villages and those two big centres together. That was the first driver, a network that connects those villages and, and big retail centres. The second driver was We've got 78 schools in, in South Dublin and what we've ultimately put together uh, here is a network that that will allow will, will result in 50 of those schools sitting pretty much directly onto that network. Uh, there's 28 or so which, which don't quite sit onto that network, but ultimately in future that they will. And then the third key driver for us was about providing a network that, that, that connected into Dunleary Rat Down. So three of our routes connect to the boundary of Dunleary Rat Down. Six of our routes connect to the boundary of, of Dublin city centre. And one of our routes connects to Fingal, which is probably not ideal. We'd obviously like to do more, but it's quite complex up there. And one of them connects in along the canal in, into, into, into Kildare. So, so they were the three drivers, our villages, our schools, and connections into our surrounding counties. That, that's it. Very good. Thank you very much. That's great. And um, Fanola is our next, um, our next presenter and Fanola, if you wouldn't mind please getting your presentation ready. Um, so Fanola is a transport pr planner and program manager with a background in sorry, with a background in civil engineering and urban planning. She is passionate about making places that allow communities flourish. Fanola has contributed to the Green School Travel Module and Smarter Travel Workplace programs, helping to create travel culture change. Fanola was the program manager in the rollout of bus based real time passenger information in Ireland and the Dublin lead on the NTA Bike Life Report published in June 2020. You're very welcome, Fanola. And um, I would like to present you, allow you to present your. Great. Is it showing up there, Jen? It's not coming up. It is coming up. Okay. Yes. So well, let's I just go. Did a stop sharing. Oh, OK. Oh, sorry. OK, there we go. I think I'm still a live person. Yeah, that's OK. And right, I can see it anyway. Yeah, there we go. OK. Super. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Mick. Um, yeah, so. Cycle South Dublin, is it wanted? Can it happen? <laughs> it's a very ambitious plan as Mick outlined. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about, well, yeah, these kind of, the subtitles here, is it wanted and can it happen? Um, on the, in order to answer, is it wanted? I'll, I'll refer back to the bike life study 
uh, which was a huge, huge study we did uh, in 2019 on the Dublin metropolitan area. So there's the Dublin metropolitan area extending from Donabay to Kilcock to Greystones. Obviously, Tala is the most important part of that, South Dublin. <laughs> but um, and it was a, a big survey, lots and lots of data collected, including the kind of key part of it was the door to door interviews that are demographically representative and independent of over a thousand Dubliners and, and 208 interviews in South Dublin County Council. Um, and just note as I'm kind of going through this, that it was pre COVID and I'll be I'll be drawing out the kind of changes post COVID. Um, and the key stats there, and I think make alluded to them earlier, was that 24% of adults in the greater in the Dublin metropolitan area cycle at least once a week. And this was actually surprising even to uh, those of us who are working in the NTA because we don't. The census only asks really, um, you know, work and work and uh, education trips. Other types, uh, other types of of surveys we've done have just been like percentage of the trips that you do, but. In terms of are you ever on a bike, at least a quarter of Dubliners are on a bike at least once a week, which is very high. Um, and that was 13% in South Dublin. 11% um, are very regular cycler, cycle, cyclists, five days a week or more. That's 4% in South Dublin. So that's what you saw there from a mixed presentation. Um, and 21% of people don't cycle but would like to start. So that's kind of where we're at. Like that's what we're focusing on. That's our potential market. Um, and just to say 54% of people that do cycle would like to cycle more as well. So there's a lot of a lot of potential there when you're thinking about is it going to work or is it wanted? Um, in terms of the reasons for not cycling, uh, the majority is you know, the main reason is concern about safety, which is something that we can address, which is great. Uh, not confident cycling and not for people like me are somewhat, when we drill into it, related to safety, related to how people feel their own capacities are. Um, um, and poor weather, as Nick said, um, it's there as a reason for sure. Um, it doesn't put people off in the Netherlands or in, uh, in, in Denmark that much. Uh, so what would help people cycle more? More Well, overwhelmingly what people want is protected cycle infrastructure. So that's sep either greenways completely separated from traffic or separated from traffic and pedestrians by curbs. And so here is a picture of um, uh, the, the coastal mobility route in, in Dunleary. So it's great that we actually have lots of um, lots of photos now of different types of people that are cycling in Ireland for a while. When you thought about cyclists, maybe the picture that came to, to mind was a male with, the, you know, from 20 to 40, maybe high vis, maybe maybe expensive bike bikes, um, and kind of just belting it as much as they could. Um, whereas what we're aiming for and what you're seeing here is that latent demand is released is children, is women, uh, different age groups, different types of bikes. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's great to see. So. Yeah, most people would say have said, and these. The, by the way, this this survey I should have said is it, you know it was door to door, it was def demographically representative. It wasn't just asking cyclists. It was, it was kind of a vox pop, um, of the of of Dubliners in general. So seventy seven percent of South Dublin residents would find more cycle tracks and um like these protected ones useful to help them cycle more, and even more than that, ninety four percent. So South Dublin residents top the poll on this one would support building more protected on-road cycle tracks, even when this would mean less room for other traffic. So there's a huge um, mandate there for building cycle, at least at a general level, and I'll come back to that later. <laughs> I mean, we all know, you know, when it gets to a street level, there can be difficulties, but at a general level, South Dubliners really, those in from St Dublin County Council really support the building of these, even when it takes room away from, from traffic. Um, yeah, look, in general, cycling in Dublin is still fairly male. Um, in terms of ethnicity, it's across, you know, it's it's even that, you know, it, it might be, it's of those regular cycles, there's as many from ethnic minority groups as of, as white people. Um, it's mainly male and it's kind of still young focused. Um, as you can see on the age profile, it really drops off when you're looking at ages over 56. Um, but encouragingly, 40% of people aged 16 to 25 cycle at least once a week. So um, 
and this uh, interestingly this kind of profile is not set in stone it's not a it's not a biological imperative and um, because 55 percent of all cycling trips in the netherlands are by women and in the netherlands and um, those over 65 make as many trips as those as those actually higher they they make more trips than any other age group over 26 so um this is a big one i think for south dublin county council what we found was that in this in this survey those who are least likely those who are, are do not have a car available in their household are also the least likely to cycle or to want to cycle and there's a feeling there when we're drilling into the data that um, they don't feel like they are cyclists, that they're not confident cyclists and they're not for people. It's not for people like me. So we were seeing that being a cyclist is associated sometimes with a certain type of person or characteristics. And um, again, maybe that um, male middle aged and maybe there's a middle class kind of thing there as well. That's that that's in people's heads. Um, and we can see here what can be accessed in 25 minutes. So, so Quite a lot of Dublin is accessible, and um, we do. We know we we know we have an issue with sprawl. We know we know we're not the most compact of cities, but quite a lot of Dublin is accessible. You can do twenty uh, six kilometres in pretty relaxed pace in twenty five minutes, and e bikes are extending the range, and they're getting ever more uh, popular. This is just, you know, kind of boring stuff, but actually I find it really interesting. Big socioeconomic, our big uh, economic model behind this, and we found that um, for every kilometre cycled instead of driven, uh, there's a benefit of a euro for individuals and the society. So, you know, multiply all of those um, trips that are being made every day by a euro and, and it's coming back to us uh, uh, manifold. And that, that this includes, you know, sometimes um, things that don't favour cycling, like value of time and 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 uh, uh, taxes for gone and stuff like that. Um, as Mick said, transport accounts for twenty percent of our greenhouse gas emissions, and it's and it's the 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 um the sector that's increasing the most. Um, so. Yeah, uh, it, we're probably down on it in twenty twenty, but you know things things. Could go back pretty quickly. There are myriad health benefits of cycling and um, prevents long term diseases. The top disease it prevents, I couldn't believe it when I found is depression. Um, I, you know, physical activity really helps in depression. It's the first probably uh, prescribed. Uh, um, yeah, the first thing prescribed when people are mental health or is suffering dementia, coronary heart disease um, and air quality. So we're all very used to you know, epidemiology is part of our lives now, but when air quality, uh, bad air quality is, it costs 1,100 early adult deaths um, in Ireland every year. And this one I'd like to highlight, it didn't come through in the report, but one in five or one in four, depending on which report you you read, Irish children are obese um, and daily exercise is ideally placed to combat obesity. In fact, it's the number one um, uh, remedy for obesity um, by the experts. So obviously an active travel, an active travel commute to school there and back is huge. And it's great to see that again, we can use Irish pictures for so many years. I put these presentations together and I'd have a mix maybe of Irish pictures. All, all of them here are, 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 are Dublin pictures actually. So there's some kids in Kerrysford Avenue and Black Rock cycling on their new cycle facility that just uh, went in over the summer. Um, and yeah, so back to our kind of key points, do people want it? Well, yeah, they do. Um, in our survey, we found that Dubliners overwhelmingly want want extra this, uh, public spends, uh, public exchequer spends on cycling. And in fact, I don't know if I mentioned that to start because I'm kind of rushing through to get to lots of juicy info, but um, this survey it was replicated across 14 different UK cities. And this was, I think Dublin was the only place where cycling was where was cycling was the place where people wanted most um the most spend so usually it was public transport but in dublin it's cycling public transport very a very close second there and then walking and 35 percent feel at, at a general level that the government should be spending more on driving but that's a whole lot of people that don't feel that way Alrighty, um no i'm just gonna skip that one <laughs> 
So if that mandate is so strong, why aren't we out doing it? Um, because it's that easy, right? Um, it's not as Dub South Dublin County Council. Um, and if any of the elected representatives are are tuned in or or their campaigns, you'll you know you've 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 been at the coalface. You've there's been protests. There's been definitely um uh, yeah. It's these you know that these projects aren't that easy because if we're taking space, uh, from traditionally what is there for cars for walking and cycling projects or we're changing junction signals to give walking and cycling a bit more time. You know, it's change and change is hard. Um, so walking and cycling projects, I always say, are change management projects. They're with a, with a slice of infrastructure and engineering, but mainly cultural projects. Uh, uh, and then there's many wedges that are needed to change travel culture, such as trials and temporary infrastructure, which South Dublin are doing now on Wellington Road. Good communication, early community engagement, which I know Mick is really big on, and um, which this this whole engagement of Cycle South Dublin and, and this webinar is part of, um, and making things look attractive uh, uh, and working with schools. Um, so yeah, these are some of the top tips on how to how to get infrastructure in. Um, oh yeah, there's our cycle. It's not a great photo, but it's there. It's Wellington Lane and the pop up cycle protected cycle facilities protected by bollards there, and. If they build it, will they come? Yes, they will. And um, we found in Willsbrook Road in Luke, and when we put in segregated protected cycle infrastructure, there was big increase in cycling and a big increase in pedestrians. And, and the Tala scheme, that the lovely cycle track there between Tala and Temple Oak, big increase in cyclists, big increase in pedestrians. And everyone always hears about um, the Netherlands and in Copenhagen, but it's interesting to maybe think about in another type of city like Seville grew their bike network from 12 kilometres in 2006 to 151 kilometres in 2013 and cycle trips um, more than uh, quadrupled. So people have said they will cycle if if there's protected cycle infrastructure and it's been shown that when you, when it's given they will cycle um, and that that graph kind of is a little bit of an anomaly here but I did want to say there's a huge kind of latent demand over and over every study we do and these this study included nearly 5000 uh, pupils P children really want to cycle. That's their preferred mode of transport. They don't really want to walk and they don't want to be driven. Their preferred, their overwhelmingly preferred mode of transport is to cycle. Um, and is the money there? So can it be done? Well, the programme for government seeks a fundamental change in the nature of transport in Ireland. There's a target spend of, and it's been cited well, and at me every day, spend a million a day, Fanola. Uh, I'm happy to do so. Um, 360 million per year, adding to about 1.8 billion over five years to enable that full step change in how we travel. Um, and what would, what's needed, you know, that's the, that's the high level commitment and the, and the money behind it. Then we need a plan for each county and resources to implement that plan and that's where South Dublin are streams ahead at the moment they've taken they've taken this is what South Cycle South Dublin is doing it's 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 laying out the plan um is cycling culture a reality well we know that lots of people want to start cycling uh, 21 percent want to cycle 58 54 percent want to cycle more we know from covid from a big study that cycling ireland did about 5,000 people that cycling as as a pastime is almost doubled during uh, COVID. So, you know, you've heard it from your fa family and friends and stuff. Everyone's trying their bikes again. Many of the, and Cycle South Dublin, the document is great on these stats, like how many of our, our, our short trips, like less than one kilometre, less than two kilometres are by car. That's a huge cohort that could, could be tapped into. As I said, children over, overwhelmingly want to cycle and protected infrastructure shows that you can bring out new cyclists. And funding is available. Um, there will be challenges, all right, and 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 as we know, we've been through them in terms of, of road space reallocation and making changes, um, and the priority that that motorised traffic might have had. But I I think our mantra in in Cycle South Dublin and in the NTA is well, we want to be moving to better problems. Like I'm happy if we're moving to you know, problems of cycle cycle congestion or where we're going to put our cycle parking at schools, all of that sort of stuff is better problems. And even even the problems that we'll be addressing at junctions, you know, they're going to be better problems because we'll be moving more people and in in more sustainable ways. All of that, that was kind of a, 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 a bevy of facts there, but I just wanted to, I kind of hate um, anecdotal stories like, but I thought might 
well as well just kind of end with uh, one that might illustrate some of the changes that are uh, uh, that that can happen there's my mum she's 73 years old she bought a bike two two months ago because she's kind of sick of walking around the same streets during covid and um, she hadn't been on a bike in 30 years she lives right on the border of south dublin south uh, South Dublin and um, Dublin City Council and she's yeah exploring their roads of green hills and she's keeping off the main roads at the moment she's still working her way up to 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 the main roads but she's doing trips that she would have done by car all the time she's not by the way the greenest you know she's not a green advocate or <laughs> or particularly fit she's she loves a car and she's a smoker <laughs> but she's now a 73 year old woman who will who will cycle around uh, cycle to mass cycle to to her local shops um, and I thought, well, you know, that does that just is just a kind of illustration of change uh, in the flesh. So there you go. That's that's, that's fantastic, Fenella. <laughs> I love that picture of your mum at the end. It's wonderful. <laughs> I wish her many happy kilometres of cycling. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, so one of your one of the interesting facts was uh, you brought up about um, it was 55 percent of journeys are taken by women in is it Holland in the Netherlands, in yeah, the Netherlands? Yeah. yeah and I find that the gender difference in cycling is a really interesting topic and um, on our online survey that we have on Cycle South Dublin um, has shown that there's a to of a total of 296 partic participants within the survey, 211 are male and only 88 are women and I am one of those 88. So why is it do you think that men are more likely to cycle than women? Why is that? It's in yeah. Ireland, you know? Looking at the data we got, Jen, from the bike life reports is about, yeah, of frequent cyclists, there's probably, you know, it splits down to about three to one um, men to women. Um, uh, it's 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 around safety. They kind of over index in rating their women would rate. Say. Safety in their Lublin as less good than men, and they definitely rate uh, cycle children cycle safety in their local area as less good than than men. So there's probably there is a kind of a maybe a higher threshold of risk there, um, which is why protected cycle infrastructure is really Im really important. Or infrastructure that will get cycling of all ages and all abilities and all genders out um so yeah so while my mom's on the roads at the moment you know she is avoiding the like if you take her as a 73 year old woman you know she's uh, she's avoiding the main roads but put some so put some segregated and protected infrastructure there she'd be she'd be uh, have no problem yeah she um, get around easy. yeah so that's that's kind of that's what we've been. I know there are some at, at, at secondary school girls particularly face maybe um, uh, gender stereotyping issues um, and it's you know there's they kind of operate on a, a different a higher level of social norms like so nobody wants to be on their bikes you know mm. want to be with the gang and stuff like that um, and then there's a bit of kind of issues around uh, um, yeah that um feeling of personal safety and things like that yeah but generally what we've yeah what you can see is is that it's about safety and it's about the, the lowering the risk threshold uh, which is really about infrastructure great and that's what we're hoping to do here in south dublin county council so i'm hoping that we get lots more women in years to come when we do further surveys mm -hmm. Um, and we get that gender balance right in here. Maybe the women might win. You never know, just like <laughs> in the Netherlands. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vanola. That was a really wonderful presentation. It was really interesting. Um, it's very, very good. Thanks very much for that. So I'd just like to introduce, um, I'll leave you there for a minute, Fanola, if that's OK. And I'm just going to introduce um, our next speakers. So Ronan Cal Carroll and Ali Manari are our next speakers. I'll introduce Ali first. Ali is the Road Safety Officer here in South Dublin County Council. <clears throat> and prior to joining South Dublin in 2018, Ali was, has worked for over 15 years in the area of sustainable communications, behaviour change and travel planning. He is passionate about engaging communities with the concept of livable streets <clears throat> and enabling them to progress towards an environment in which independent sustainable travel is the default mode of choice. Ali one day hopes to own an electric cargo bike of his own and we all wish you the best Ali in in uh, 
that in that wish coming true. So Ronan Carroll is our next speaker um, and Ali and Ronan have given me a, a recorded presentation. So Ronan is um, the project manager of the Dodder Greenway here in South Dublin as well. He has 18 years industry experience with 10 years as a design engineer and he has been working on pedestrian and cycling improvement schemes in both Fingal and South Dublin County Council. So I will just share this presentation with you now. Jan can get in, maybe. Hello, yeah. Hiya, can you hear me? I can, yeah. What did Sorry. you say there? Just getting a fair few WhatsApps that people, that participants can't get in. Yeah, that's okay. We're just going to okay. go ahead, Fanola, okay, and perfect. we're going to um, record. Didn't know if it was just a let in thing. No, there's been an issue. But I think what we've decided is we're going to carry on, record it, and at least put it out online and explain the situation. So if we can just keep going. So can you guys see the screen that is being shared? Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I'm having a difficulty here. OK. Thank you, Jennifer. My name is Ronan Carroll and I am the project manager for the Dodder Greenway on behalf of South Dublin County Council. The Dodder Greenway has been in the pipeline since 2012, which was when the feasibility study was carried out. Uh, it has been funded by both the NTA, the National Transport Authority, and the European Regional Development Fund, the ERDF. The Greenway is to be on a par with the best greenways in the world. It's to be four to five metres wide and is to be a lit cycling and pedestrian facility. It's over 70 kilometres long and it links Sir John Rogerson's Quay in Dublin city centre to the entrance of the Bornebrina Reservoir just past Kiltipper Park in South Dublin. SDCC are responsible for 14 kilometres of the scheme from the Bornebrina Reservoir um, to Orwell Park in Rathfarnham. Due to the complexity of the project, it has been split into three phases. Phase one is currently underway, it's on site, and it is the construction of the three pedestrian and cycle bridges. Phase two is the parkland links between these bridges, and that was just tendered in uh, September of this year. Appointment of a main contractor is due in a couple of weeks in December 2020. And phase three is a little bit more complicated. The, uh, it involves the on-road works, and that is due to be tendered early next year. This is a photograph of the layout of Bridge One, which is to the rear of the Ballbrook Centre. And the purpose of Bridge One is to connect the communities in Avonbeg and Millbrook Lawns to the Greenway and on down through Dodder Valley Park. And um, there's some progress photographs which we have uh, shown here. So this is the carcass of the bridge without the deck. And um, there is handrails to go in, which have an integrated public lighting within the handrail. As, as part of Bridge One and the Fairhouse Road, all of the bridges will have uh, public lighting within the handrail. Bridge Two is the Kavir Estate, uh, which connects Temple Oak Village to the Greenway in Kavir Park. Uh, some progress photographs attached. Uh, these are, this is the bridge being installed in Kavir Park before it was craned into place a couple of weeks later. But that was put in place uh, in the middle of the summer. This photo is also in Kilvere Park. It's to the back of uh, Tesco in Raffarnham Shopping Centre. There's a service yard or service road at the top of that bank, and we uh, were looking at a green engineering solution, and it just shows how far green engineering has come. Um, that's a reinforced earth bank, and there's quite a significant load on the top, so it was it was great to be able to put in a green engineering solution there as opposed to a standard reinforced concrete retaining wall which wouldn't have, have, have complemented the area at all and we feel that this solution really will complement the area when, when it starts to get some growth of plants and grass. Bridge 3 is to the rear of Raffarnham village and connects the area of Ratdown Avenue through Bushy Park uh, over uh, the Dodder River, over the wall to Bushy Park, over the Dodder River and onto the, the Greenway, direct access onto the Greenway for those in, in turn, your, particularly in the Ratdown Avenue area. Given that Bushy Park Woodland has a, has many high grade mature native trees. 
care was taken early in the design to try and minimize the negative impact on the trees. So the bridge has a curve on it at around 90 degrees and it, that was in order to get around the mature beech tree that's shown in the photograph. So the photograph is just taken during the night lift just to show the installation of the bridge and the care that was taken to avoid any impact on the mature trees that are in the woodland of, of Bushy Park. Um, this is a photograph of the main bridge lift. There was a road closure required on, on Springfield Avenue, so it was, what, it was quite a significant crane that was needed to, to lift that section into place, but everything went to plan and the, the bridge was installed on time and the road was opened on time at about 7 a.m. the next morning. And this is just a photograph of the, of, of the almost finished product. The, bridges in and the abutments are built and constructed. There's anti-graffiti paint. That's uh, a treatment that's been painted onto the, to the concrete um, champagne glass piers is what they're called. And what's left now is the uh, the deck is to go on and the public lighting handrail is, is yet to go in place. Um, as well as engineering challenges, there was ecological uh, challenges and protection measures that were required um, and given the environmental sensitivity of the Dodder Valley and the Dodder River itself, um, it, the decision was made early on in the project to appoint an ecologist to the design team who would supervise the works. And this was a, a great benefit. We were able to try and uh, get ahead of any environmental challenges um, the ecologist could advise and we could try and uh, design solutions that had uh, the smallest negative impact on the ecology as possible. Um, the bridges are clear span. They were designed uh, to be um, prefabricated offsite and then constructed close to the site and then craned into place in, in one lift to try and minimize the impact on any of the ecology of the area. And the site clearance of any trees was completed before the bird nesting season. And um, the invasive species, uh, there's some invasive species present in bridge too. So there was a treatment plan in place and uh, the ecologist oversaw that work, which was um, which was great to have. Um, the tree protection plan was required for the tree bridges. So an arborist uh, surveyed and assessed all of the trees in the area and any of the ones that were to be kept and their root protection zones were to be um, protected. There was a, a plan put in place for that and inspected on, on a regular basis. The, there's a lot of bats on the dotter and the lighting, the bats generally don't light artificial lights. So the lighting design and the operation, operational regime was of, as such that it would minimize the impact on the bat. So a lot of care and attention was, was put into that. Um, and we came up with a lighting design and operational regime, which would have, uh, which would have, which would not have a significant impact on the bats. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions or comments on the daughter, please feel free to post. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Ali. I'm the Road Safety Officer for South Dublin County Council. Uh, and I'll be doing a short presentation on the opportunity that Cy Cycle South Dublin brings to get more children pedalling to and from school. I'll be disappearing from your screens because the camera hides um, some of the content of the slides, but I'll see you on the, on the other side in about five minutes. So let's look at how we are currently travelling to school in South Dublin County Council area. So the CSO data from 2016 shows that the two dominant modes of getting to school for primary age children are traveling as a passenger in a motor car or traveling to school on foot at 43%. And bicycle is at 2%. So bar the train in Lewis, it's the least preferred mode of getting to and from school. And since 2011, there's actually been a 9% increase in the number of children traveling to school as a passenger in a car. Nationally, then, um, you can see that there has been a significant decline in children traveling to school on foot and by bike, unsurprisingly, um, and this sort of stagnates then around 25% between 2002 to 2016. And then on the other side, then, the car traveling to school by car has dramatically increased between 86 and 2002 and has a um, steady uh, growth rate up until 2016. So our secondary school students then, uh, the CSO 2016 data shows that traveling to school on foot is the most um, preferred mode of getting to school. Um, and this is followed by then the uh, traveling as a passenger in a motor vehicle. And we can see there that bicycle is actually um, 4%. And interestingly, since 2011, then there has been a 30% increase in um, passengers 
traveling to school in a car to get to secondary school. So at a national level then, unsurprisingly, um, there's been the collapse in a number of students cycling to school between 1986 and 2002. And then uh, there's been an inverse relationship then, and um, the number of students being driven to school has significantly increased over the same period and continues to grow up until 2016. And going back to the bicycle then, between 2002 to 2016, there's been a slower decline in the number of cycling to school, um, but actually there's been some good news in that 2016 saw the reversal of this trend with a 10.5% increase since 2011. So there are now over 7,000 students cycling to school by bike at a national level. Um, so within this then over 90% of these students are male, um, but the number of female cyclists has grown by over 30%. Um, over the since 2011. So it's coming from a small base, but still good news all the same. So this leads to an everyday image like this outside our school. So parents um, either sitting in their cars or idling, waiting to collect um, pupils, students leaving the school. Uh, for anyone who's been near a school, particularly pre-COVID, uh, it can this picture can be relatively tame and actually during school drop off pickup times, it can feel a little bit more like this. And unfortunately, this has led to more of these signs popping up around the county in that schools have to um, actually thank people for parking in a way um, to make it safe for children to get to and from the school. So we're probably all too familiar with the, the cars parked in the double yellow lines or on the footpath or in the cycle lane. So how do we get to this then? So Cycle South Dublin um, has plans to become one of Ireland's cycle friendliest counties. Um, how do we actually achieve this? How do we make it safer for children to travel to school in an independent way? Um, and how do we also make it more appealing then for families to um, ditch the car and use bikes um, to get to and from school? So we all know how um, cycling is good for our health, good for our well-being, and good for the environment. But we certainly can't achieve it by this. So this is a mixture of, um, I suppose, engineering enforcement issues, whatever your take is on it. Uh, you can see the school on the right here, and uh, drivers are blocked cycle lane and up on the footpath. So this makes it incredibly challenging for anyone um, to, to use the cycling facilities and then to also use the pedestrian facilities as well. So here is an example um, of a segregated cycle lane. Um, and in my opinion, it's a good one in that you can see on the left and on the right, there are barriers to prevent people from actually up, um, entering this cycle facility. Uh, that's not to say that, um, you know, issues can't arise using this type of infrastructure, but it's just a, it's a, just a good example of, of what could be achieved. Um, and you can see then the table on the left shows our existing cycle network and the number of schools that are within a certain distance of that, and how with rolling out Cycle South Dublin, this increases significantly um, across the four distances. So between 100 metres, there's 31.1% schools within the net, within 100 metres of the network, um, and up to 400 metres within the network, there's 88.1 schools within the county. So how can we supplement um, the Cycle South Dublin, well, we can look at school street and school zones to kind of um, remove traffic or reduce traffic arriving at the school gate and making it safer for children to walk and cycle to school. And this is an example from Ingall School Street in Malahide, which actually showed a 50% decrease in the number of children um, arriving at um, the school by car. Uh, and also um, South Dublin has um, plans to roll out four pilot school street, school zone, and style projects over the next year. So thank you for listening. I'll pass you back to Jennifer, and if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat and hopefully we'll um, get to answer them later. Thank you, uh, Ronan and Ali, for um, that. That was very, very good. I, ha I think I'll give uh, Ronan his question first, if that's okay, Ronan. Um, so your question here is from Rebecca. Um, 
Rebecca has a question about greenways and the lighting of the Dodder Greenway. She asks, how will the paths be lit? Um, will sensor lighting be used? And if yes, yes, what distances ahead of and behind of a person will there be light? And it's over to you, Ronan. Um, the issue, I suppose, with, with greenways is that it's it's usually near a river, which is the case that we have at the Dutter Greenway. So we're we're looking to get a balance between public safety and and, and environmental sensitivities. And um, so the presence of bats along the Dutter River corridor, um, there's many bat species there. I think there's six or seven, and in Ireland there's nine species altogether, and and a lot of them are found on the Dutter. Um, so a needs based public lighting strategy is recommended in guidelines uh, for the protection of bats. So with that in mind, we proposed a, a, a needs based public lighting strategy, which is essentially sensors. So when you come up to the, the first lamp standard, there is a, a sensor on it that uh, triggers the next four or five lamps to come on and they come on quite quickly with uh, LEDs. Now um, the drivers can go from zero to whatever looks that you, you wish to have quite quickly. So um, it's in, in European countries, they call it a uh, follow me lighting. So as you hit the first sensor, the next four or five lights come on. And as you come to maybe the middle of that bunch, the next four or five come on and basically the path is lit uh, for for cyclists and users to, to travel safely through. And then as after you leave, there's a period of about two or three minutes, you can set it to whichever time you want and then the, the lights power off then as there's nobody there and it reverts back to darkness, which is what uh, bats and foxes and badgers and different wildlife, it's, that's their preference, obviously. Yeah, that's very good. So in other words, if there's maybe 15 to 20 metres between the lamp standards that there would be, as you say, four to five lamp standards lighting at once, there's a good maybe 60 metres approximately? Yeah, it depends on the area. It's, it's a very flexible system. So if there's a curve in the path or it's, it's you know, you can't see fully in front, it can light, you can light more. It's it's really up to the end user. We can, uh, there's flexibility in the system to adjust as we see fit. Excellent. That sounds great. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Thanks a million, Ronan. So my next question is for you, Ali. So Ali, I have a really good question here. Um, Ethan Chalk, he says to say hi. He says that he met you at school once. That's cute, isn't it? So Ethan is six um, and he loves cycling and is asking Santa for a bicycle. And he says that he sometimes cycles to school, but he would like to cycle more often. And Ethan's question is, what is the name of the cyclist in the logo? That's behind me. <laughs> Um, Ali, you're on mute. Hello, Ali. Hang on, hang on. Hello, we can hear you. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, sorry, it just keeps flicking on and off. Yeah. OK, so um, I suppose cycling to school, I think the Green Schools Ireland programme tells us that um, Almost 90% of children want to travel to school in a sustainable way. And um, certainly. Did you hear my question, Ali? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Did you hear the question was, what is the name of the cyclist in the logo? OK, oh, well, we don't have a name for him. So do you want to name him, Jennifer? Well, I think we did name her. And her name is Sophie the Cyclist, I believe. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, I thought you knew that one. Um, I have another question for you, Ali. You're not getting away with it that easy. So maybe you'd like to give Ethan a little wave there. Um, so your next question is from Alex. Um, and his question is, what are the challenges around the school gates for vulnerable road users, especially for children who cycle to school? Yeah, so um, I suppose the key challenges around the school, um, as many observed by many, would be uh, general road safety behaviour and um, driver behaviour outside the school can make it a hostile environment. Um, but research from the Green Schools programme shows us that 90% of um, children and students actually want to cycle to school. Um, so there is a desire there um, from the younger population to cycle. Um, but maybe there's, I suppose, a uh, lack in confidence around cycling about the decision maker within the home and 
possibly we, we might need to look at um, not to look at the school trip in isolation, but then to look at it as so I cycled to school on the way to the school drop off and maybe we need to think about how do we get them from their bikes to work, to the shops or to wherever they need to go. And then the same for the way home. So on the school pickup, um, are we thinking about their cycling to the swimming club, to sports training or after school grinds or whatever? Very good. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Ali, and you too, Ronan, um, for both of those presentations. They were very good and for answering our questions. Um, our next speaker is Kevin. So, Kevin, if you wouldn't mind getting your presentation ready to share, please, that would be great. Um, and I'll just give you a short introduction. Kevin Baker is here with us tonight and we're delighted to have him. You're very welcome. Um, Kevin is the chairperson of the Dublin Cycling Campaign. He leads the charity in its work to enable and encourage more Dubliners to experience the joy of everyday cycling. He believes that cycling has huge potential to transform all of Dublin into a more vibrant and livable city where people of all ages and abilities cycle as part of their everyday life. His advocacy work is focused on organising communities to help them build the safe cycle routes they want in their neighbourhoods and how he can make combining cycling and public transport to make people's journeys easier. So with that, um, I would like to ask you to share your um, You can see the screen there. Presentation, please. Yeah, I can. I'm just getting ready to put you up on the screen and there you are. Perfect. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Um, so Dublin Cycling Campaign is a charity, um, and I suppose what we're trying to achieve is a vibrant, livable Dublin where everyone can enjoy walking and cycling. Um, when we ask people who cycle in Dublin right now, what is the one word they associate with cycling? Um, these are the responses we see. Um, so freedom, joy, fitness, fun, happy. There's also a few words in there like risky, danger, death trap. So to some extent, cycling is not always fantastic and enjoyable in Dublin, but it could be if we want to make it that way. There are three things people need to cycle. They need something to cycle, they need knowledge on how to cycle, and they need a route that is suitable for their needs. I think the thing that's really important here is like a suitable bike for someone might not be suitable for someone else. So someone with a balance issue might need a tricycle. Um, someone who's trying to carry lots of kids might need a slightly larger bike. Um, people need the appropriate knowledge to cycle. So this might be knowing how to ride a bike, but also kind of some skills about how to navigate traffic. I suppose what we're really here tonight to talk about is this last big one, which is a suitable route for people to cycle. And that's suitable for their needs. The, way people travel is a really deeply personal choice. Um, a huge number of criteria go into why people travel the way they do. Everything from convenience to how much they need to carry to is there bike parking at the other end? Is there car parking? What's the price? There's a huge number of criteria. And so to some extent, we need to think, how do we kind of make these choices as easy as possible for people if we want to encourage them to walk and cycle? So one of the things we hear quite a lot is that cycling is a niche activity for a small group of people. And I kind of really just want to dispel that myth in a moment. There's a fantastic um, series of research papers uh, from Dr. Jennifer Dill, who's a professor of urban studies and planning. And it's about this idea, which is called the four types of cyclists. Um, so this is a model. People don't neatly fit into these four buckets, but it's a really useful way of thinking about this problem. Um, about four to 7% of people fit into this strong and fearless category. They're the people who will cycle kind of no matter the conditions. You've got this enthused and confident group next, which is another small chunk. Um, these are people who want to cycle. They have a bit of confidence. They might cycle in mixed traffic, but they really don't want to be. And then you've got this really big bucket, this interested and concerned group. It's like 50 to 60%. They, they were interested in cycling, but they're far too concerned, they're lacking the confidence, they're lacking the safe route. So I'm gonna use some stereotypical images to just try and drive home this point. Strong and fearless might look like this group who are happy to cycle on kind of rural roads with high speed traffic. They might be happy to cycle on multi-lane roads. They're very strong, very fearless. 
you get the enthused and confident who are probably most of the cycle commuters in Dublin right now. They have a lot of confidence, a lot of experience on the roads, um, but they would like to see upgraded infrastructure. The infrastructure matters most though for this group, the interested but concerned. Um, this is the Grand Canal cycle route in Dumb City Centre. A proper curb protected cycle route with cyclists having their own traffic lights. There's a huge diversity of people cycling here. The other group that kind of fits into this like interested but concerned are these kids cycling to school here who are from the D12 cycle bus, um, which is an organized group cycle every Friday to Green Hills National School. If it wasn't for the parents to some extent coming together and forming this pontoon of kids who cycle to school, they wouldn't be able to do it um, because of the lack of infrastructure. So to some extent, to kind of dispel the myth that cycling is a niche and that only a small group of people want to do it, we have always said, look at the Netherlands, look at the huge numbers of people from all walks of life who cycle as part of their normal everyday life. We see lots of kids and family cycling. We see lots of older people cycling in the Netherlands. But to some extent, the Netherlands, it's, they're so very far ahead and it feels a bit, it, it's, it's, it's a foreign idea. So the, the full quote for seeing is believing is seeing is believing, but feeling is the truth. We can see the Netherlands and all we can do is believe that Dublin could be like this. But it's only when you start to experience it in Dublin that you start to realize maybe this could be very true. And I suppose particularly over the last year, we've seen a number of projects across Dublin that have seen huge increases in the number and the diversity of people cycling. Uh, so the top two photos of the coastal mobility route in Dunleary, um, seeing lots of people who you wouldn't normally see cycling out cycling. The photo on the bottom left is from Grange Gorman Road in Dublin city centre. Um, this road has uh, the TU Dublin campus on it, and it also has two national schools and a large number of houses. Uh, it used to be a rat run for people trying to avoid traffic on the main roads on either side of it. Dublin City Council installed some bollards and there's been a huge increase in the number of people cycling to school. So, uh, Fanola has gone and stolen one of my photos, but there's a coastal mobility route um, and Griffith Avenue in Dublin City Centre. Both of those projects were built in the last year. They both started design this year as well. It was very quick to get these implemented. We're seeing much more older people cycling. Uh, so the photo on the left is from Dunleary uh, and the two wonderful women on the right are from Galway. Um, these two women have been friends for decades and both took a notion to some extent that they wanted to go buy a tricycle. And then they both arrived on the same week and they went to show each other their tricycles at the same time. Um, the woman on the left said, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's put years on my life. Uh, and she cycles with her grandson to school um, most weeks. We're seeing much more families cycling in Dublin. Um, lots more people are moving around by bike and we really are trying to dispel this myth that cycling is for a niche group of people. Um, these photos are from a Grell school in Monkstown, just off the new cycle route in Dunleary. There has been an absolute explosion in the number of kids cycling to school. As Ali said, kids really want to be cycling to school. They really do. It's a when we look at those words at the very start, the ones that kids also talk about are freedom, fun. They enjoy cycling to school. There has been a massive explosion since the cycle route has gone in. As I understand the number one uh, thing a lot of those kids in that school are looking for this Christmas is a new bike. Um, I wish their parents luck because bikes absolutely are selling out of the shops right now because of COVID. So this myth isn't true. What is true is cycling can be an option for everyone if we design it with everyone in mind. A lot of the cycling infrastructure that we've kind of built up to this stage has been painted lines on the side of the road. Um, it has been targeted at people who are strong and fearless or confident and enthused. It hasn't been targeted at everyone. What Mick and his team are talking about doing here is a program of work to make cycling a real option for everyone. And I'm not saying we need to do every trip by bike, but we at least need to make a lot more trips possible by bike because a lot of trips aren't possible by bike for a lot of people. Okay, 
The second kind of big idea I want to talk about tonight is kind of changing our shared public space. So public space is kind of the streets, the parks, everything that is kind of shared by all of us. We all have a stake in ownership in how our streets look, how our roads are designed and how our public parks work. Um, to change public space, I think you need these three things. You need designers, funding and political will. The designers are the staff in, Dublin, or in South Dublin County Council. They are committed to this. They have a plan. Fanola is saying the National Transport Authority has the money from the new program for government. There is the funding. If you want to see change, you need the political will. It's key stakeholders bought in on the need for change. And key stakeholders are councillors, your neighbours, community groups, you and me. We're all stakeholders in how we design our public space because our public space is shared by all of us. I want to show you some examples of how public space can change over time, just to kind of give you a bit of an idea of what kind of opportunities exist out there. So this is at the Frascati Road in Black Rock a good few years ago now. Dual carriageway, narrow footpaths, no cycle lanes. This road was upgraded a few years ago. There's still two traffic lanes, but there's now a new curb protected cycle track for most of this road, much wider footpaths and more greenery. This is Dundrum Village about two years ago, who recently made their street one way in order to provide more space for people walking and shopping in the village as part of COVID. So that transformation looks a lot like this. There's now public seating and there's planting, there's trees and there's a counterflow cycle lane. Um, this is Glenview, this is the roundabout kind of by Glenview Lawns in Tala um, before South Dublin County Council upgraded it. There aren't clear pedestrian crossing areas and there's no cycle lanes. This is what it's been upgraded to. There are now cycle lanes and there are much clearer, much better pedestrian crossings. So there's a huge opportunity to do not just cycle improvements with these projects, but a lot of other work as well. Greening, better pedestrian improvements. Um, this is in key just outside the forecourts in the city centre. This used to be two lanes of general traffic, a bus lane and car parking along the river. Dublin City Council have recently reallocated space to provide a larger footpath, a cycle lane, these green planters in the middle, while still maintaining access for cars and the bus lane for buses. South Dublin County Council has been doing a lot of good work on projects over the years. As I'm sure many of you know, like not all of these projects are easy. Um, the design will change over time. Um, and that's all about the key stakeholders. Everyone, that's everyone being involved in these projects, being engaged and trying to make them work. Um, I'm a really big fan of the design motif that um, South Dublin County Council used for their bridges. This red style is just really quite iconic. Um, this bridge connected communities together. Um, I think it replaced a 25 minute walk for most people with a three minute walk. Huge, huge community improvement because of a, a walking and cycling project. There are so many opportunities we have with public space. It's a decision we all need to make together. The way that happens is by talking together, working together and engaging. Um, the coastal mobility route in Dunleary is not just about a cycle lane. It was about uh, providing new benches and public seating along the route for people to meet up and to have conversations. I want to end with this photo here to some extent to show what can be possible. Um, Dunleary have called this new cycle route on their coast the coastal mobility route for a reason. Um, and they picked the word mobility because what it means is it's the, it's the ability to move freely. We need to get out of congestion. We need to get out of traffic. And it's routes like this that provide mobility, the ability to move freely to a lot more people, people, particularly children. It provides them with the freedom and independence to move around, to meet their friends, to cycle to school, to go to training on their own. That's all I have for you, Jennifer. Thank you, Kevin. That was very interesting indeed. Um, 
And you had some wonderful pictures there, not only of South Dublin County Council, but also of the Netherlands and the lovely Dublin city. So on that note, um, I have a question for you. And this question has come from Mick Denton and he's with the Men's Shed. And his question is in relation to, um, it says here, <clears throat> the Dublin cycling campaign have been quite focused on Dublin city. How can this translate into our function functional area here in South Dublin and what different challenges would that bring? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's lots of things South Dublin can learn from the other councils uh, across Dublin. Um, at the same time, every situation is different. I think South Dublin County Council has different challenges to Dublin City Centre. Um, one of the challenges in particular is there's a lot of major national roads in South Dublin County Council that are quite difficult for people walking and cycling to cross. Things like the N7, the N4, the M50. Um, and there's a lot of industrial estates with a lot of kind of heavy goods vehicles. And that doesn't really exist in Dublin City Centre or in Dunleary. So there's definitely new challenges to face in South Dublin. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things to look, South Dublin to look for is particularly some of the quick changes Dunleary and Dublin City Council have been doing of late. Um, these are things that started off with kind of wands and lines of paint, which are quite ugly but over time have evolved into kind of the picture of that planters outside um, the forecourts. So it was initially quite a utilitarian engineering project, but is now also about how do we improve the public realm? How do we provide more seating and a better public space? Um, and the projects are moving very quickly because it's, it's temporary, it's a trial, and if it works, they'll keep it. If it doesn't, they'll take it out. And they have taken a few things out, but a lot of the stuff has been really well welcomed. And it's a great way of seeing, it's a great way of removing that fear factor of change by just saying, let's try it out. Mm -hmm. like the trials are a fantastic way of removing that fear. Yeah, that's excellent. I agree with you fully there. And um, I've just opened up now to everyone. If you'd like to ask questions, please do um, put them into the questions um, Q&A part of the um, on the right hand side of your screen, please. Um, and that what you're speaking about there um, about trials is quite interesting because we too have a trial ourselves coming up and Mick, maybe you might like to uh, talk to us a little bit about our trial on Wellington Lane. Um, you might like to discuss that. Yeah, yeah, really happy to. Um, we, it's interesting, I, th I think I agree with, with you know, most of what Kevin said there as per usual. Um, and I think um, we there was there was originally a part eight for Wellington Lane, um, which was considered by the council back in in maybe 2016 or so, and, and and ultimately the scale of the change that the councillors sought at that time, given local concerns, ultimately warrant you know didn't didn't merit the scheme going forward to, to delivery. And and but since then, I think there's been huge local interest from schools and community groups, you know increasing number of new councillors very keen to see something happen there. So we actually started a, a level of quite much more detailed engagement with community groups and had a number of kind of workshops uh, with with uh, schools and community groups in the areas just before COVID uh, happened, actually. And, and we were quickly progressing with the with the revised part eight um, on that basis. And actually COVID happened, we, we installed an initial kind of light segregation along the first phase of that, about a kilometre. And it's been well received. We've had to move some stuff around, um, but actually just at the moment, we're now implementing the second phase of that, which is segregation, light segregation at Templeville roundabout, Orwell roundabout, and along the second phase. So ultimately, we'll be up to about just over two kilometres of segregated cycle lanes through light segregation on both sides of Wellington Lane and across those two roundabouts. And that's actually happening at the moment and that's a that's that's kind of a full light segregation scheme done and, and the intention now is we're just considering where we're going to do more of these um, and we've been talking as a team about exactly the locations that we're going to do those in but there's probably another three or four to happen in in the not too distant future uh, we just need to agree what they are but um but yeah that's going into the ground at the moment the you know the, the work is being done uh, tonight so, yeah. yeah, fantastic. That's great. And actually on the there's a survey um, on the consult 
um, port consultation portal of South Dublin County Council for our um, for the scheme that you're discussing, Wellington Lane. And there's been over 100 people have participated in that. So that's quite encouraging. Um, and there's a lot, a, an awful lot of very positive um, comments coming through that, which um, which is wonderful to see. So um, I'm going to now ask um, Sheila and Mary. Uh, Sheila, please, if you could um, give us a few questions and tell and maybe direct them towards the people that they're for, if possible. OK, thank you. The, I have a question in from Raid Foresight from the Dublin Cycling Campaign. She said, um, well done on this ambitious plan and may the wind stay at your back for the next 10 years. However, side by side with this, we need soft measures to encourage more people to cycle and the existing network is in need of upgrading improvement in spots. We need to ensure that the network is complemented by safe routes to school and to shops. Um, I'm not sure who could answer that, but maybe Mick would. Yeah, I think Mick would be well. Yeah, well, well I'm not too much up and um, but like I said at the outset, for us, I think getting kids to cycle to school is, is really important. That's why um, 50 schools within the proposed network would be on the actual cycle network itself. There's 78 schools in the county at the moment, 50 of them would, would, would sit on this network. Um, but, but that will all take time and we appreciate that. So again, the purpose of the light segregation uh, projects that will be rolling out over the next, well, starting tonight and, and rolling out over the next while, um, you know, for example, uh, the intention of some of those will be to provide that segregation in place, you know, in a, in a much quicker time scale. And then the third piece around around the schools is, as Ali's already, already referred to, the council at our last council meeting just agreed a programme of eight uh, school street locations um, across the county uh, with, a, with a nice spread across the county. Um, and we're progressing now with appointing a team to, to, to work out the details of that work with the schools so that we can get moving on the first four of those. Uh, and that's that's one of Ali's key pieces of work. So maybe Ali would like to say anything more about that on the school street piece, Ali? He's probably on mute. Ali, you're on mute there. Could you turn yourself on, please? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, cool. OK, so just in addition to the school streets and school zones that we'll be exploring over the next year or two um, with the council, uh, we also part fund cycle training in primary schools and that's a cycle right program. So if schools are interested in participating on that and getting their children trained up on good uh, cycling skills for the road, uh, you can uh, get in touch with Cycling Ireland. They offer the cycle right program as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, Mary, have you got a, any questions that you'd like to throw into the group? I have indeed, and uh, this one comes from Colin Kelly. He's a keen cyclist from Rathfarnham, and he's asking about the safe cycling widths. And this is something that has come up, in fact, with um, the Road Safety Working Together group. So Colin wants to know, will the cycling strategy have due regard for safe cycling widths to ensure that both experienced and inexperienced cyclists will feel confident and safe when cycling on the public road? And also, will the appropriate signage be provided? So I don't know whether that's, um, Ali, I think you might be familiar with that. Well, Mary, I'm, I'm happy to start and, and maybe Fanola might want to jump in as well. But, but ultimately, okay. yeah, look, absolutely. That's, you know, right at the beginning, I understand a few people weren't, you know, there was a technical issue at the start, so a few people have been laid into the meeting. Um, uh, yeah, like some of our objectives is absolutely DMOR's NTA cycle manual, segregated cycle lanes where possible, you know, achieving those really high standards that the NTA have. That is absolutely the number one objective for us when we're designing these schemes, you know, these cycle schemes. Um, and ultimately, you know, we'll, we'll be we'll be working hand in glove with, with Fanola and her team. And ultimately, you know, we won't be securing funding for schemes that don't do that. Um, I mean, Fanola, is there anything you want to add on that? 
Yeah, um, just probably there might be a little bit of a trade off at the start between some of the newer kind of build stuff like um, the uh, pop up cycle infrastructure or the, cur the kind of quick, quick build, uh, fast curb um, protected cycle lane in, in that we're going to be trying to go in there and, and do and, and change the painted cycle lane and um, to a curb which is which is protected and which can offer that level of um you know security to those more inexperienced cyclists um so yeah and, and by going in and doing that and retrofitting you mightn't get the width all the time you know we might be down at 1.5 meters um it's the only when we go back in to build a full road reconstruction, which is coming and you know, isn't done easy or cheap or or quickly, and um, that we can really get the widths up to two meters uh, or 1.75 to two or, or more than that. So yeah, I think it will be a trade off maybe for the quicker for the faster build stuff, but we're trying to build the momentum of the network and um, get new cyclists out there. And at the same time, if we can sort out junctions, it'll it'll really help experience cyclists who might want to stay on the road um yeah so and um, yeah it's sort of like I'm, I'm just kind of flagging there might be a trade-off in the early st stages and um, new builds you know where we're, we're taking a whole carriageway and we're re we're changing all the drainage and we're adding new foot or increasing footpath widths and then you know build building, building a whole new road which doesn't come cheaper than two million a kilometer lads um yeah we'll definitely be getting good widths but uh and the quicker stuff, it just might not be possible. Thanks, Vanella. Um, Sheila, would you have another question there for us? Do I have one here from Kieran Riley in Ratfarnham? He says he's a keen cyclist. He cycles to work every day. However, he has heard all this before that we're going to fund all these cycling infrastructures. Infrastructure. Can we guarantee? that this money will come to South Dublin County Council? That's a question I'd say for the NTA. Panola. Um, yeah, as, as much as I can guarantee, uh, all, the programme for government is there. And that there's a commitment in money terms there. We've, we're putting together, the NTA has put a plan together, which includes South Dublin County Council, South, Cycle South Dublin, um, uh, for how to spend, it's kind of a plan on how to spend 1.8 billion over five years, and and it's it's extremely extremely ambitious. Uh, and with the minister at the moment, um, we're but we're planning on the basis that that is going to be approved. Um, that the well, I mean the commitment is there in the program for government. Um, it's not as as Kevin said in the triangle. Um, money is one aspect, political will is another. And none of these projects come easy. Um, I think particularly in the last couple of years, as people can mobilise quite quickly via WhatsApp groups and stuff like that, to where, where fear is a factor and fear of change is a genuine factor for people. They can be, you know, it can be it can be tough to get projects which are in essence change management projects through. So yeah, you need really good designers. You need great money. You need the money, but you need the political will, which it, which you know. Um, it can be difficult to secure when when there's quite a lot of people that might be the, whose fear has been triggered about change. Um, so yeah, in my experience in my professional life, we've never had this kind of budget before. We've never had this kind of high level political commitment before. Um, yeah, uh, and yet I don't underestimate the task at the local street level um, because I think it's maybe harder to put projects in than it ever has been before. But you, you, you know, we're putting the best foot forward here with Cycle South Dublin. It's a great plan. It's really ambitious. It's out to public consultation. It, Mick and his team are trying to, you know, have it sign up at a political at, with the councillors at a, at a high level, like that this is the vision. And then it just makes it easier as you're kind of getting through the implementation. And I have a big checkbook. The, with the blank check. So <laughs> glad to hear <laughs> that, Manola. <laughs> we're very happy to hear that because we're very willing. We've got lots of cycle tracks to build. Thanks a million for that response, Vanilla. Um, Mary, have you got a question, please? I have indeed, Jen. And uh, Kira is a young mother in um, Woodstown and she's asking about how will local people and councillors be involved in the design of these pieces of infrastructure? 
So, Mick, I suppose, uh, on, yeah. on the democratic side, um, where, where, where do we stand with that? Yeah, I think um, absolutely. I think, you know, community political input into the process is, is, is important. Um, I think we've learned from historic schemes that we've tried to deliver with, say, limited or less public engagement has resulted in schemes where, you know, when you're in the ground delivering it, people are out protesting against it. So actually, we've recognised that. And, and for us, as Jen's already said, and Fanola's already said, for us, the starting point for meaningful community engagement is about a programme showing people that we've got a well thought through idea, a well thought through plan to how we deliver a connected network. Because, you know, a lot of the accusations we get labelled as, or why are you doing this roundabout? Why are you doing there? You know, none of it's joined up. It's all, all over the place. None of this is going to make any big difference. So actually for us being able to say, well, no, we've got a coordinated plan, which will ultimately do that. That's bought into a, at a political level that the public have had a chance to feed into and to input into it to help us shape so that when that programme is agreed, then what we would do is then on each individual scheme, we would progress to part eight. And in advance of the statute, there would always be a statutory consultation, but in advance of the statutory consultations, we would also do, depending on the project, we would also do a level of meaningful engagement. So, for example, the Wellington Lane scheme that I spoke about earlier, we've held several workshops in the local area with councillors and community groups. We're also now trialling the light segregation uh, uh, model out there, given its local contention, to test what our preferred solution might look like and change the design accordingly. Whereas in other areas, it might be much less controversial and actually we can much more quickly move through that process. So like where we know them to be quite contentious, where that's where we'll do, you know, a really lot of, of, of non-statutory early engagement to help people shape the process so that when it gets to that part eight stage, councillors feel like there's been real meaningful engagement. There's a lot of people in my area who want to see this happen because there are those people there. Absolutely, they exist. Um, and when you don't do that, ultimately what you tend to find is those people who don't want it, they shout against it, they shout the loudest and then councillors are, you know, councillors believe that the whole community don't want it. So the more we can drag out the support, it, it kind of gives those councillors whose, whose role it is, is to be the voice of the people, you know, they know that there's a stronger voice of support, so they feel empowered to be able to kind of, you know, positively determine those and grant, grant, grant us permission to go ahead and build them. So it's fundamental to, to the long term rollout of, you know, a huge a transformational change. You need that political support to make that happen. Otherwise, you're just going to be fighting every single scheme uh, on the ground. So. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, great. And therefore, Kevin, we need you to help us as well to get these projects through. Um, oh, it's, it's not just me, it's, it's every community. Um, ev no, I'm, I, I agree. I think the best example I've seen recently has been up in Belbriggan. Um, the Harry Reynolds Road Scheme um, is a cycle project on the road being done by Fingal County Council. Um, there was uproar about the number of trees that needed to be removed as part of the project, but the designers from Fingal County Council and the NTA worked really closely with Belbrick and Tidy Towns and a number of community groups up there, and changes were made. Um, improvements were made to the project for Belbrick and Tidy Towns, and at the end, the project that they have got, the design that they just approved two weeks ago, is really good for cycling and really good for the community. Um, so it shows to some extent when people do come and work together, when communities try and figure out a compromise, something that works, we see really good projects move through the process. Fantastic. Sounds like a wonderful project. Um, thank you, Kevin. So who, Sheila. Uh, Sheila. Yeah. Question. Uh, Dom, please. Yeah. Dom McGuire, who works in City West and a keen cyclist, has a question. Why have we selected these particular routes? Um, I suppose uh, John. Sheila, I think we, I think we had, answered that one. That was covered earlier in the in yeah, Mick covered that one earlier. Have you got hey. another one there, Handy? I, I have one here actually, and it's from um Lelia O'Donovan in Knock Lion and she asks um, how long is it or what is the length of time required from conception of design of a project to turning a sod? So I might pass that one to you Mick. 
And I was going to suggest I'll pass it to one of the engineers, uh, either maybe Ronan or, or Fanola. I can say on average it's about three and a half years. It depends on the complexity of the project. Anything with environmental kind of elements to it um, would take longer. Excellent. Um, so it's not it's not short, is it? And it can go on and on. The more the more complex the project that it is, uh, yeah, the more difficult. But from from the start of inception through to optioneering and like we are moving into a space where we're doing lots more public engagements prior to the official public engagement, which is part of the planning process. All of that is great, but it takes time. And just to say <laughs> on the Balbriggan project and I'm like, I, I don't want to sound negative at all, but I'm just kind of sound a note of them as well. We try to get community engagement at early stages and it's only when we got contentious issues <laughs> that sometimes we get the communities out and then we work together like, you know, um, so but we, we you know, in Wellington L Lane, uh, South Dublin we worked really, really hard to get like 50 people in a room um, who would be willing to discuss a cycle project that was not yet contentious like um, whereas you could. You, so it, it's an interesting and kind of look it's a it's a paradox sometimes if things aren't contentious there's no interest and if they are then you're already on the back foot but um yeah at the same time i think what we found a lot with with them um, in terms of public engagement is that schools are really key um if you can get it to school communities they are probably a hub of community at the moment you know um yeah and they um they, they can get yeah you can get great kind of interaction between and like a lot of our local trips, our schools, um, and yeah, they're a great source of kind of play, place to start with community engagement anyway. Yeah, that's true. And actually, I involved in a lot of that community engagement for Wellington in the early stages, and it does take an awful lot of work, a lot of engagement with schools, a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails. So it is tough, but it's rewarding. So it's quite, it's good if if projects work, it, it's working well. Um, Mary, have you got a question for us, please? I have, and this I think is my last one. Um, Sue is a motorist from Tala. And she wants to know, will there be space left for the private vehicle? That's a very good question. Um, so Fanola or Mick, who would like to take that one? There's always going to be space for cars, that I know. How much though? Maybe. Yeah, look, I mean, yeah, look, of course. I mean, this isn't a, an either or situation. Um, I think the challenge is, is that streets in general, I think the part of the challenge that we've had in Ireland in particular is, is that the streets that have been built, there, there has been no uh, recognition of the need to provide some of that space towards cyclists. So ultimately what this program is about is just about rebalancing that uh, and ensuring that all road users as kevin referred to earlier on it's about mobility not just for cars it's about you know balancing that equation a bit better to give people the opportunity to cycle so it's not about uh, taking away loads of space for cars and, and prioritizing cycling above everything else it's about better balance across all mobility pedestrians cyclists cars you know, there's always going to be a need for cars and buses and public transport and vehicles etc moving around the city of course for us it's about it's about that balance and each scheme will have a different you know a different design to to meet that to meet that aspiration i don't know if Anola, is there anything you, you wanted to add sure it's a, it's about balance and rebalancing and for me as an engineer the word efficiency is always is, is kind of what drives um transport planning so you can get a lot more people moving uh, on foot, on bike, by bus than you can ever do on, on cars. So for those who are, really need to drive, um, it's much it's in their interest that everyone who doesn't <laughs> is doing something else because um, that really, really frees up uh, road space for those who do need to drive. So I suppose, look, you know, I'm, I don't have the time to kind of give a lesson on, and, and nobody wants it either, a lesson on transport planning, but we did in the 1960s and 70s change the way we 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 um, designed our, our our streets to become roads, and it was all vehicle dominated, and um, and they were just trying to redress that and, and pull a little bit of space back, I suppose. Um, you know, uh, there a huge amount of people are car non available. I I think in certain wards in Tala that could be over fifty percent. 
so while we we think everybody can drive and does drive and, and should still have the right to drive everywhere there's still a huge cohort of people that can't drive and are are stuck and um, especially if they're living in car dominated environments uh, where car dependency is is high uh, it was interesting in cycle south dublin in your in your document um that you see that some of the the lead the uh, the places where that have the least amount of cycling are the you know have maybe the highest areas of deprivation and um, so they probably you know they really uh, cycling could offer huge opportunities for those people to to access education to access uh, employment opportunities to access social opportunities and um, which maybe isn't there at the moment so yeah it's about a rebalance um, and bearing in mind that a lot of people uh, can't drive but the car is absolutely part of our transport system and is going to be uh, but it's it's maybe pushing that towards we're thinking more about m mobility and um, how many it's about people movement rather than vehicle movement um, and a lot of our other designs are much more efficient at getting people around rather than vehicles uh, so while it looks like there might be queues lots and lots of queues actually a lot more people are moving um, so yeah that's that's kind of it Great, thank you. I have one question and I think that um, we will leave it there. And this question is from Seamus Johnson in Lucan and he asks um, that he cycles and he says um, that it's great that all of these new cycle tracks are planned and he welcomes every one of them. But he says, where do people park their bikes? So who would like to take that? Fanola, would you like to take that one? Uh, sure, cycle parking is is huge part of cycle infrastructure. Um, yeah, so at the end, and it will be, it will be, I'm sure, part of this as we're moving towards more detailed design. It's not there on the network, but I like at the high level. Uh, but it is clearly part, going to be part of the infrastructure. Um, and I know that, say, on big um, public transport interchanges as a proposed by bus connects cycle parking and um, a variety of different types like freely available kind of your chef field stands and maybe options for more secure bike park and they'll be looked at as well and the nta have uh, a, um, an app i think the planning aspect of sorry, sorry i i thought you'd finished there um, i was just going to say the the nta have an app for bike parking which is a really good app it's very useful May I come in there? Sure, Sheila. Go yeah, ahead. South Dublin County Council as part of the July stimulus have got funding from the NTA to provide bicycle parking. These are the safe lockers. The oh, very lock good. are providing them for us and we picked a few locations. So we we'll, um, we are putting some up at City West here out beside the Tala Lewis and up at Liffey Valley. We also have other cycle, safe cycle parking there beside the Civic theatre and up in Ratfarnham and we hope to have more next year. And also as part of the cycle, the July stimulus, we have put in a lot of uh, uh, bicycle parking in our parks, in a lot of our schools and in some of the villages. Fantastic. So we're, 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 that's also part of this um, Cycle South Dublin. Brilliant, thanks for that. And have you got any more questions there yourself, Sheila, or shall no, we leave it at it that? No, that's it now. That's it, more. great. Listen, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming along and attending this um, this talk about Cycle Site Dublin, a programme of work. And I would urge you all to go on to um, the consultation portal, Site Dublin's consultation portal, uh, to make a submission and have your say and tell us what you think of it. We're very eager to hear your, your views on this. Um, I'd like to thank all of our pre uh, presenters and speakers tonight. Um, in particular, our partners, Fanola from the NTA and Kevin, from uh, the Dublin Cycling Campaign. Thank you very much for taking the time out from of your evening to come and join us this evening. Thank you, Ronan. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Mick. And thanks to Sheila and Mary for their help with the questions. Good night now, everyone. And if you'd like to ask us any questions, if we didn't get to your question, please do send us an email on cycle at swcoco.ie. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, that's just finishing now.